Um, as Rachel mentioned today, I want to talk about bird conservation in southern Ecuador. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here with you guys. So just to throw it out there, I'm a Virginia native, but I consider myself bi-coastal. I spent more than five years doing field work in the Eastern Sierra at Mono Lake and also in the Northern Sierra outside of Chester at Lassa National Park. So I love Eastern or green-tailed towhees and I have a big place in my heart for, for the Sierra Mountains and um, Sierra Nevada, excuse me. Um, but these days, you know, I was once a field biologist for Point Blue Conservation, and now I work internationally on conservation projects, specifically in Ecuador. So prior to taking my job at Hokotoko Conservation Foundation as executive director, I worked at American Bird Conservancy. Some of you may have heard of ABC, as we like to call it. Um, I was the deputy director of international programs, and I worked in over 10 countries throughout Latin America. And I just really developed a soft spot in my heart for Ecuador. And when the opportunity came up to help them build capacity and continue spearheading conservation projects in Ecuador, I thought to myself, well, why not? But I thought I'd start this presentation with a brief overview of what Hokotoko does and go a little more in depth with that and then talk, talk about some of the projects on the ground and, and what it means to do bird conservation work. So Fundación Hokotoko was established in 1999. Our mission is to protect some of the most threatened species and habitats on the earth. So as Rachel mentioned, not only is it one of the most biodiverse regions in the planet per square kilometer we have more biodiversity than any other country in latin america so we accomplished our mission by strategically purchasing properties for the establishment of private strictly managed protected areas we also do restoration of degraded systems and we also help communities adjacent to our reserves protect their natural resources so as some of you may have seen in the annual report that was circulated, I'm pretty proud of our, our highlights. We have 23 years of conservation successes. So we have protected over 24,000 hectares in our private reserve network. And so in acres, for those of you who don't do hectares, I'm terrible with the metric system. That's over 50,000 acres. Within those reserves, there's over 117 species of amphibians. We've planted 1.6 million trees throughout our reserve network. We uh, protect 94 species of mammals in our reserves, 118 species of reptiles, and for the Audubon folks, over a thousand bird species are represented throughout our reserves, or 10% of all bird species worldwide. And so as I mentioned, like that's 0.001 six percent of the earth's surface so ecuador being right on 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 the um, equator belt having access to the pacific ocean the andes mountains creating all these ecosystems and this huge elevational gra gradient cr creates so many incredible habitats and thus incredible niches for bird species so as Rachel also mentioned, um, Fundacion Hokotoko has a reserve network of 16 reserves. And I like to think of this as like basically a mini national park service. So as you can see on this map of our 16 reserves, the ones that are highlighted in red with red points also have eco lodges. And one of the ways that we help fund our operations because many national park services don't pay for themselves is that we offer ecotourism at some of our reserves where we have super incredibly rare bird species that you cannot see anywhere else on the planet. Um, furthermore, we also, our 14th reserve was established in the Galapagos to protect the Galapagos petrel, which is an, a critically endangered species. Um, and, and generally speaking, when people think of Ecuador, they think of the Galapagos. And I like to tell them, 
no. The Galapagos is the icing on the cake. Um, the mainland of Ecuador will blow your mind. And one way to do this is by visiting our reserves. So you might be asking yourself, well, why the funny name? Why Hokotoko? So as you can see in this picture is an ant pitta species, the Hokotoko ant pitta. And we, um, as a term of endearment, like to refer to the Hokotoko Toko ant pitta is our, is our big boss. Um, the Hokotoko ant pitta was discovered by Bob Ridgely in 1997 when he was on an expedition with some other scientists in southern Ecuador. Um, for those of you who have never heard of Bob Ridgely and are unfamiliar with um, ornithology in the neotropics, Bob Ridgely was the first author to write a book about the birds of Panama and make it accessible to Panamanians and the North American audience. And while he was doing the species descriptions for the birds of Ecuador, he was in Southern Ecuador in this really remote cloud forest that basically butts up against the Peru border. And all of a sudden heard this bird unbeknownst to him that started making this hokotoko, hokotoko no noise. And uh, back in those days, we didn't have digital recorders. So he took out an old school tape recorder, recorded the bird, played it back. And then this ant pitta just popped out of a bamboo thicket. And for those of you who know anything about ant pittas, ant pittas don't have tails because <laughs> they can't really fly. They're sulky sort of furtive um, tropical forest birds. And they're generally speaking, really drab kind of brownish. They might have some speckling or some dots. And all of a sudden this bird that you see on the screen, this beautiful bird with you know the mustache stripe, the black crest and the brown wings just popped out. And Bob Ridgely and his company knew immediately, holy cow, this is a new bird to science because there's absolutely nothing else that looks like this on the planet. And so when they started digging around and trying to learn about the, the bird and understand its habitat requirements, they realized that the Hokotoko ant pitta's home range is no larger than the size of New York City. So when you put that into perspective, and you think of Ecuador, which is smaller than Texas, and it has at least 15 endemic birds that occur nowhere else on the planet. Here was this special bird in these cloud forests in southern Ecuador that had never been seen before. So Bob and his companions realized, well, we have to do something. This bird is in an area that's um, suffering from severe fragmentation and um, habitat encroachment. And so they decided to create the Hokotoko Foundation in Ecuador named after the Hokotoko Ant Pitta. And our first re reserve was created in 1999. So thus the origin of the name Hokotoko. So all of this began then at what we now call our Tapi Chalaca Reserve. And I was just at Tapi Chalaca less than three days ago. It is our premier flagship reserve in Southern Ecuador. It's in the Samora Chinchipe province. And Tapi Chalaca currently protects 9,800 acres of cloud forest. And it is just this extraordinary place that's just like dripping with you know epiphytes and bromeliads and mixed flocks of tanagers and rare parrot species and as you can see from this photo there's this zigzaggy road that winds down the valley so you're you're um situated high up at about 10,000 feet in a cloud forest. And cloud forests, generally speaking, are rainy like 98% of the time. And thus, they're super lush. 
There are also hot spots for orchids. And while I was in Tapichalaca, we may have come across a new orchid species. And to me, it's pretty incredible to know and see that um, there's still room for discovery. We're discovering new orchid species in uh, Tapichalaca, but also from the background on my screen is this other part of Ecuador called Cerro de Arcos, which was our 15th reserve. And Cerro de Arcos was created to protect the blue-throated hill star hummingbird, which was discovered only two and a half years ago. And we're not talking about, as we like to say in the birder world, the LBJs, the little brown jobs. This is a very incredibly distinct hummingbird. So there's there's this sense of romance and discovery and excitement that knowing that somewhere like Ecuador, there's still this opportunity to find new things and there's still areas of intact forest that harbor all kinds of biodiversity. So as I was alluding to then, um, Tapichalaca is an extraordinary place for bird watching. So here on the left, there's a photo of the golden plumed parakeet. Um, this is a, I wouldn't call it an endemic, but definitely a specialty of Southern Ecuador. Um, relatively easy to see at the reserve. On the right, we have um, a mountain toucan, also just a bird that pops in the forest when you see it at Tapichalaca. So, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to create a reserve and keep expanding it, um, but reserves and conservation require community buy-in. And so while I was down at Tapichalaca, I was visiting one of the neighboring communities and on the side of a building, there was this gorgeous mural with the Hokotoko ant pitta and um, I, it was right outside of the municipal building. And what it illustrates to me is this, this sense of, of consciousness of, and pride of endemic species. You know, like in the States, we think about uh, how each state has its own bird. So for instance, I live in Virginia and the state bird is the Northern Cardinal. And then my neighboring state is West Virginia and the state bird for West Virginia is the rose-breasted grosbeak. Whereas you think about a country like Ecuador and some of the other countries where I've worked throughout Latin America and you have regional birds that are emblematic because you have the, these birds that are considered an alliance for zero extinction birds because they only occur in one place and nowhere else. It's not like a cardinal or a northern cardinal, which you can find all along the flanks of eastern North America, or a rose-breasted grosbeak that migrates back and forth. So where I'm getting at with conservation requiring community buy-in, um, when I was working for American Bird Conservancy five years ago with Hokotoko as a partner organization, the Southern Reserves Director came to me one day and he said, Wendy, I think you need to visit our Tapichalaca Reserve. There are some communities that are lower elevation that have been asking us how they can participate in projects. It's just like anything. So you can't force a project and you can't force conservation. You need a certain amount of willingness. So the project that I'm about to showcase you guys started between five and six years ago. So I like to think about this project in phases. So phase one was, okay, we have community buy-in, so how do we create a conservation culture within the buffer zone of Tapichalaca? So while I was at ABC, our first step was, of course, to use birds as the gateway drug to conservation. Um, and one thing to consider with birds is not only do you have the endemic birds, domestic exclusive specialties to Ecuador, you also have migrants, neotropical migrants. 
our friends, the warblers, some of the thrushes. And the benefit to warblers and migrants is that there's US funding from the federal government. So we were able to get funds from US Fish and Wildlife Service to create programs to work with coffee farmers. Because the other thing about areas where neotropical migrants like warblers and thrushes and, and uh, flycatchers occur is that they generally occur at the perfect altitude for growing coffee. So I'm sure some of you have heard in the past about bird-friendly coffee. So um, just to go on a, a slight tangent, for my master's degree, I studied at Humboldt State University in, in Northern California. And I had the opportunity to work with Matt Johnson, a professor at, uh, in the Humboldt Wildlife Department who had been studying um, bird-friendly coffee plantations in Jamaica. And what he wanted to be able to show was how by creating habitat that has trees and shade coffee, you can quantify the economic benefits of having trees on your property because birds then eat pests that can plague your coffee berries like the coffee berry borer beetle. And so he was the first professor to be able to show that there is an economic value and there's an ecosystem service benefit to having trees on farms. And uh, the importance behind this was because starting in the mid eighties in Brazil, Brazil used to be, Brazil and Vietnam, I think still are two of the top coffee producing regions with probably Colombia as the third coffee producing region in the world. However, just like with technification for viticulture and wine production, um, scientists started finding ways to create coffee cultivars that could produce more and produce more coffee beans in the sun. But what that means is mass destruction of habitat. So in Southern Ecuador, what we wanted to look at was how do we work with the local, local coffee cooperative association where we have cerulean warblers, black Bernian warblers, olive-sided flycatchers, Canada warblers, and recreate and sort of um, strengthen coffee coffee plantations and what we call the coffee agricultural matrix. So as you can see on the left, this is an example of sun coffee where it's, you've got strips of banana and then in the foreground, you've got um, coffee bushes. Whereas on the left, what we were trying to do is take these patches of coffee producing areas, reconstruct connecting corridors and create more habitat for birds. So one of the things that we did in phase one was we tried to incentivize farmers with reforestation. So you can't just tell a farmer, I learned this in Jamaica, like put some trees on your land and that'll, that'll make it better for the, for the birds. You know, you, you need to have a little more incentive. And, and the cool thing about the coffee growers association that we were working with in Ecuador was that they were already certified as organic. And what they were trying to do was to increase the quality of the coffee that they were producing so they could get a better market value internationally. So one of the things that we did was we built community nurseries. Um, we help them gather seeds and produce not only fruit bearing plants, but native trees, lumber plants with a long-term strategy of how to plant anywhere from 40 to 100 trees per acre interspersed amongst the coffee farms. So, you know, the benefit of this is not only for the domestic, for the migratory birds, but you have great benefits for a local species because at this elevational gradient, it's not only migratory birds. So you're enriching habitat, you're bringing back trees, and you're reconnecting zones that at one point or another might have been totally cleared because not only is coffee a major threat in this area, but one of the, the major um, drivers of deforestation 
patients cows and I'm not even going to go into cows I have a whole nother presentation about cows but cows throughout Latin America are one of the major destructors of habitat so aside from planting trees and um, enriching habitat and working with coffee farmers to increase the quality of their product through using natural fertilizers and reducing the use of chemicals and pesticides. We had a citizen science component, and I think this is really um, important. And before the presentation started, uh, Lowell or Lal, I might be pronouncing your name wrong, I apologize, alluded to this. And there are organizations like Birders Exchange and um, Cornell as well that provide binoculars. So I personally, took um, more than 30 pairs of binoculars down to Southern Ecuador. And we did a training program in citizen science. And we taught coffee farmers um, how to monitor birds on their coffee farms. We taught them about migratory birds. We taught them about um, the local resident birds. And starting four years ago until now, we started monitoring the birds that were on the coffee farms with the long-term objective to see like how cough, um, how the, uh, the species composition of birds on coffee farms will change and adapt as shade trees grow. Um, and this is incredibly important for birds like the one on the left, which is the cerulean warbler. And I have a very special soft spot in my heart for the cerulean warbler because I live in Northern Virginia on the Blue Mountain um, and cerulean warblers nest on my mountain. They don't nest on my property, but they do nest on the wildlife management, um, which is the east facing slope. And for those of you who may not know, cerulean warblers and Canada warblers are two of the fastest declining warbler species in all of North America. I mean, drastically declining. So thus one of the objectives of this project was to to help condition habitat in the overwintering grounds because one thing that most people don't realize, and I didn't know this before I worked for ABC, was that um, migratory birds spend more of their life cycle on the overwintering grounds than they do in the breeding season. So by the time I returned from this trip to Ecuador to my mountain home in Virginia, cerulean warblers, are gonna be with young, they're gonna be packing it up and they're gonna be getting ready to stage their long and treacherous journey across the Caribbean through Colombia into Colombia, Ecuador and Peru and as far south as Bolivia. And that's their overwintering range, range, excuse me. And essentially they will spend from September through April in Latin America, thus incredible importance. So if we can monitor these species, we can collect data, we can get more buy-in from communities, um, we can quantify our results and we can help boost habitat in the North. We can help hopefully shift some of these major declines of bird uh, neotropical migrants. So then phase two of this project is how do you build a conservation corridor? So on the left, and I'm doing this because I want all of you at some point to come and see these incredible mountains. They're just, the Andes, oh, they're like no other. They are extraordinary. I mean, they are like the Blue Ridge Mountains where I come from on steroids. And as you can see, you've got all these ridge lines, um, you've got patches of habitat and you have everywhere from lowland species to all the way up to Tapichalaca cloud forest where you can get a wealth of hummingbirds, specialty birds like the ant pitta, the mountain toucan. Um, you can get also the white necked parakeets which I'll show you in another slide. So we started thinking, okay, we have community buy-in, We've been working with the coffee farmers for the last four years. And then last year, the local municipality created 
um, what they're calling the Palanda Municipal and Sustainable Use Protected Area. However, um, generally what tends to be the trend in Latin America is that municipal reserves are kind of low on the pecking order as it stands. Um, national parks throughout Latin America do have some funding, but they generally have a lot of budget cuts. And that's why I like to say, you know, if, if government was forces to have strong protected areas, there wouldn't be a role for conservation NGOs that create private protected areas. Thus, um, why Pocotoco has 16 protected areas throughout Ecuador. So however, what we realized was that our neighbors in the municipality of Falanda had declared this municipal reserve and on paper, it sounds like a great thing. It's a municipal reserve that butts up against two national parks, the Hokotoko Tapichalaca Reserve, and then other uh, private protected areas. However, if you don't have protection and you don't have monitoring within a private protected area or a municipal reserve, you're gonna have to deal eventually with encroachment and deforestation. So we started thinking about how could we build off of the work that we've been doing for the past five years. So we approached a European foundation, Fundación Segre, and told them about our project and said, look, we have been working in Ecuador for 23 years. We've got basically this nas mini national park service. We know how to set up private protected areas. We know how to train park guards or park rangers. And so we want to work with our neighbors to strengthen what they're doing but also to create connectivity. So as you can see on the left, there's this purple outline and that's for um, a UNESCO biosphere that was declared globally. So if you've never heard of biosphere reserves, you've got man and nature, you've got cultural biosphere reserves. And so they are very special places that are deemed of biological ecological and cultural importance on a global scale. So for instance, when I used to work in Jamaica, in Jamaica, the John Crow and Blue Mountain National Park is considered a UNESCO biosphere reserve. So within that purple outline, you've got um, this sort of olive green out, which is the Podocarpus National Park. Um, the forest green is our reserve, Tapichalaca. Then you've got this sort of mint green, which is Yakuri, another national park. Um, and then you've got this hash line sort of mustard colored municipal reserve. So because of this opportunity to expand the project, we can now help protect an additional 50,000 acres. But on top of this, one of the things that we notice is that um, it's sure we can patrol we can do monitoring. We're gonna set up nest boxes for endangered parakeets in this area um, because a lot of these cavity nesting birds no longer have trees that are large enough for them to nest in. But we need to reconnect of the deforestation component. And as I said in one of the initial slides, Hokotoko has planted over 1.6 million trees throughout our reserve network. So the idea here in, in, the, in the first part of this um, connectivity and the buffer zone project is to analyze where are the best watersheds and where are the places that have been deforested so that we can start planting trees to reconnect all these habitats from 2000 feet in elevation all the way up to 13,000 feet. And thus, not only would, be help, would we be helping to protect, protect an additional 50,000 acres in Southern Ecuador, but we'd be creating a buffer zone and a larger protected area network of over 100,000 acres. So to me, that's really exciting because as I said, one of the recipes for success is community buy-in. You've got protect, private protected areas, you've got national parks. And then to kick it up a notch and take it to the next step, 
one of the things that Hokotoko is doing is we're looking at carbon financing. So how can we take these private protected areas and community managed municipal reserves and create long lasting financial mechanisms to ensure that there's a way to pay for this long term because many national parks don't pay for themselves. National parks, as we've seen even in our own country in the United States, are constantly suffering from budget cuts. Therefore, municipal reserves that include a matrix of private land need financial incentive to make sure that forest and habitat isn't cleared. And so carbon financing is something that's on the horizon. Oh, and then on the right, we have this gorgeous bird, the um, hooded mountain tanager, a specialty of mixed flocks, as I mentioned before. If you come to Tapichalaka, you never know when a mixed flock is gonna hit. If you've ever uh, done any birding in South America and in cloud forest, it's a magical thing. Like all of a sudden you're walking along, things are really quiet. And then all of a sudden you hear whispers in the forest and there's like 10 or 15 species of tanagers. And sometimes they're mixed with warblers and other species. And then you've got this beautiful blast of color. So I'd like to sum all of this up by how you can help. Um, first of all, I wanna thank all of you who are here for being members of Audubon societies. Um, or excuse me, Audubon chapters throughout the United States. When I worked with ABC, several Audubon chapters contributed to conservation projects. But just from being a member of Audubon, you already have a passion for birds and you already have an understanding of the importance for nature. So there's lots of ways that you can help. And I'm not going to do, you know, the common pitch of like open up your pocketbook and donate. Although if you want to do that, I can tell you how to do it. But I will say um, that I'm a firm believer in the mantra of reduce, reuse, recycle, and repurpose. And I travel to Ecuador at least three to five times a year, and I carry lots of heavy suitcases. And so if you find yourself with an extra pair of binoculars or old field gear, gear whether it's camping equipment, rain jackets, rain pants, old headlamps, I will carry it down to Ecuador. Um, our reserve network has over 46 park guards and we're constantly looking for ways to find equipment um, and field gear. Our park guards are incredibly dedicated. Some of them have worked for us since 1999. They work in all sorts of conditions from coastal habitats to cloud forests where, where you feel like you're in Humboldt County and it's cold and wet all the time. GPSs are also welcome, but anything and everything helps. And like I said, I carry suitcases. Um, on the right to this example of field equipment that I just brought down for this last trip to Ecuador is the white-breasted parakeet. And as I mentioned, for this community conservation project in the buffer zone, we're setting up parakeet nesting boxes. Um, this is a beautiful species. Five days ago, um, I met with a local community member that we had trained on how to monitor birds. His name is Freddy Ramon. And he called me up and he said, I wanna take you to the spot on the edge of a farm. And there's this tree and it's got a little hole in it. And if you go there at 6.30 at night, you'll see three white-breasted parakeets and they all go into that hole and that's where they roost every night. And this is uh, an endangered species. And so one of the things that we're trying to do while we re rebuild the forests of tomorrow is to put up nest boxes for them to um, hatch chicks and also use them as roosting sites. So other ways that you can help, and I, I've, I've said this pitch throughout the presentation, is visit our reserves. And if you want to know how to do that, you can either check out our website, you can contact me directly. We have a sister for-profit organization called Hoko Tours, and they support us. If uh, you want to do a guided tour, if you want to do uh, a reserve uh, circuit, whether it's you wanna to try to hit up all the reserves in one trip, although that would be a really long trip, or you wanna do Southern Ecuador, which is extraordinary by the way, or you wanna just go to a few places. We have on the ground dedicated staff 
And when you visit our reserves, you're helping to pay for conservation because all the profit that's generated from visiting our reserves helps to pay our park guards, it helps to pay the property taxes, it helps to pay the maintenance for our lodges, it helps to maintain our trails, and it helps to make sure that this 50,000 acres of private protected areas throughout Ecuador stays protected. And so this is a night jar that was just photographed five days ago by Jim much more. And as Rachel may have mentioned, and she'll share his Instagram tan, uh, handle, Jim much more is our design guy. And he also runs the Save the Choco campaign, which is a campaign that we're running in Northern Ex Ecuador. For those of you who have never heard of the Choco, there's less than 2% of the Choco left in all of Ecuador of its total habitat. And the Choco is this incredible lowland tropical rainforest um, with over 20 endemic bird species. It is an extraordinary place and it's a place that we're pushing to protect very quickly. So your visits can help with that. And lastly, well, wait, not lastly, another way you can help um, is if you don't wanna just visit reserves as a tourist, um, some of you may have heard of volunteerism. It's a way to give back. Um, you pay a small fee and you can come and stay from at several of our reserves, be it the Galapagos, be it on the coast to work with baby sea turtles and reintroducing great green macaws or our Buenaventura Reserve and helping with our parrot nest box, nest, nest box programs. But our, our volunteerism projects also help ensure the long-term sustainability of reserves. So this is another way not only to experience the incredible nature of Ecuador, but it's also a way to connect culturally and connect with our park guards and be somewhere and create a sense of space and really feel like you're having an impact on the ground, whether it's the restoration projects, sea turtle monitoring, nest box projects, Hokotoko ant pit of monitoring, data collection, or a myriad of other activities. And lastly, I try not to go into politics, but I do firmly believe that one of the best ways that we can vote is how we spend our dollars. So as I mentioned earlier, I studied um, coffee farmers in Jamaica, and um, I also have a background in food politics, environment and community and conservation. And I think it's really important what we buy, especially when it comes to tropical commodities like coffee, chocolate, teas, mate, and understanding where these, where these products are coming for, that farmers are paid a fair wage so they don't have to fall into the fertilizer trap of buying more and more chemicals, to um, keep up an unsustainable system, but also to buy tropical commodities that are produced in environments that are shade friendly and bird friendly. So with that, I want to say thank you for inviting me to present and for listening, and I will open the floor to questions. So thank you. <clears throat> All right, let's see what we got here in terms of questions. Um, I did see one a little bit ago. Um, this one here, uh, Wendy, I think the, you'll have to tackle the first part of this one and then I'll have to tackle the second part. That's, um, is it COVID safe to uh, come to Ecuador now? And could you coordinate a Fresno Audubon trip there? So Wendy, I'll let you address that first part. I would love to do that. So yes. Um, Ecuador is becoming a lot more COVID safe. Right now, we are in the process of ensuring that all of our staff are fully vaccinated. We're at a 75% capacity rate. Um, at, as I speak, I think tomorrow, several of our staff are getting their second dose of the vaccine. Um, I traveled to Ecuador in late March and was here for six weeks. I was already vaccinated when I came. Um, we do offer really small group tours as well for safety. We practice social distancing and you know all the sanitor sanitary measures. And if you guys want to coordinate an Audubon birding Fresno excursion, I would love to even join you guys for that. 
And like I said, we have Hoko Tours, which is our sister organization that does all the on the ground stuff. So whether it's just a Southern Reserve excursion or you wanna to go to the Choco or you wanna do a sampling of everything, even like right outside of uh, Quito where I am right now, the capital city where all major flights come into Ecuador, we have our Yanacocha Reserve where you can see the Black Breasted Pup Lake and Chacana where you can see uh, Andean spectacled bears very easily, uh, Andean condors um, and several other highland species. So absolutely, we would love to have you guys. Um, we are also eventually going to plan like a very um, VIP celebrity bird, bird uh, small bird tour with Steve Howell. I don't know if any of you've heard of him. He's the the uh, the author, the co-author for the Birds of Mexico, and he also leads tours in Ecuador. So he is committed to doing like a small exclusive tour to fundraise for us. So especially right now, we are really hurting because our tourism revenue, as you can imagine, dropped significantly last year, like 95%. So as we reopen our reserves, like I said, it's not at full capacity and we keep things very safe. We would love to have you guys. So open doors, it would be fantastic. Okay, thank you, Wendy. And as far as uh, Fresno Audubon organizing a trip, um, that's some, I certainly can't sit here and um, you know give a definitive answer on that one way or the other, because um, you know something like that obviously is going to you know require you know a lot of planning and um, a lot of um, just a, a lot of money as well, of course. Um, so I'd, I'd have to bring something like that that up during our next board meeting, which will take place later in the month. So. Um, I will bring that to the table and just kind of see if, if that's something that is feasible. And if by chance it is, um, and we are able to put something together, Wendy, I'll reach out to you and we'll um, see what, what we can do and we'll put the word out. Certainly. And I, um, if you do have a hand. My internet. Okay. Oh, sure. Yeah. Let's keep going with questions. Let's see here. Okay, um, okay, let's start here. Okay, well, this one's a compliment. It's a, from Susan Joy, it says, awesome presentation, Wendy. Wendy, hope to meet you in Ecuador. Um, and then we have three questions um, from Ron uh, Martin. Uh, let's see, uh, what is the elevation of the Hokotoko Park? And is it Andean? Um. So Tapichalaca is in the Andes, it's east facing slope. And Tapichalaca, the lowest point is at about 7,000 feet and it goes up to 10,000 feet. Um, as I mentioned, we have 15 other reserves. So um, anywhere from coastal reserves where you can see the Esmeraldas woodstar, which is the tiniest hummingbird in all of Ecuador to as, high up as 15,000 feet. So if you see this background back here, this is Cerro de Arcos. I mentioned it earlier. It's it's a bit of a huff up there. I'm not gonna lie, like you start kind of feeling the elevation. So we have all elevation ranges. Um, next week, I'm going to Narupa Reserve, which is at about, it's between 4,000 and 6,000 feet. And this is a hot spot for cerulean warblers and other, um, Amazonian foothill specialty birds. So we've got a little bit of everything because I totally understand that sometimes trying to tre trek it at those high elevation uh, spots is difficult. Quito's at 9,500 feet. And when I always, when I first get here, the first couple of days, it, you have to acclimate. Oh, go ahead. So for our next question, um, does ecotourism in Ecuador employ lots of Ecuadorians? Is it a big business? Is it as big as coffee growing? I would say that ecotourism in Ecuador is probably a larger business than coffee. Um, coffee only occurs in certain regions and at certain elevations. And as I mentioned earlier, most people, when they think of Ecuador, they think of Galapagos. So the majority of tourism in 
to Ecuador is for the Galapagos, it's big bucks. Um, but for our reserves, like I said, we have Hoko Tours that helps organize and coordinate all of that. That is an Ecuadorian owned organization. All of the people that we employ at our reserves are Ecuadorian. And um, so it is a major um, economic force in the country and something that was incredibly affected by COVID. Um, you know, we have lots of conservation projects. And so when we have new job postings, one of the things that I've noticed for hiring is that we get a lot of people in the tourism sector that are looking for jobs because tourism hasn't totally opened back up. So um, yes, to that. Okay. And the next question, um, let's see. Oh, here we go. Uh, I'm going to rephrase this just a tiny bit. Um, what uh, sort of brands is, uh, what, what sort of um, shade grown coffee brands would you recommend that people buy? Or not buy for that matter? Um, well, what I would say is that don't just buy coffee because it's organic. Because just like other pro uh, products, organic might just entail that they're not using agrochemicals to produce it. So there's a couple ways that you can go about this. Um, shade, uh, bird, Smithsonian bird certification is not easily acceptable and having worked with them, or not, excuse me, not easily acceptable. It's not as commonplace as USDA organic. So um, I know that they're looking at reframing like the certification standards on a landscape level. Companies that I've seen nationwide are Birds and Beans, Thanksgiving Coffee, but also another thing that you can do, and um, I've seen this throughout California, is talk to your local coffee roasters and see like if they're direct sourcing and if they're buying directly from farmers and what sort of st standards they have. Um, because there are a lot of programs and a lot of farmers that are already doing bird friendly stuff, but they may not be certified. So it might take a little additional, you know, background research, um, but it is out there as well. Okay, awesome. So uh, the thank you for that. And the next question would be, I guess this isn't really a question, it's more of a, a, a compliment great presentation and i would be really enthusiastic Thanks. about a hoko, hoko tour uh, to any one of the reserves or participate in a volunteer and then um yeah the so um email me like i said i put my email address in in there and you can check out the hoko Toko website we are reactivating mm -hmm. our volunteerism program and we can send you documentation about that that explains how the program works, the minimum stay or the full stay. And it's, it's, really, it's really a great way through volunteerism to immerse yourself and like feel like you're giving back. Okay, awesome. Now our next question here is, how can we encourage the United States to take an interest in the area and increase uh, visibility? Wow, that's a good question. Um, I, I feel like, uh, um, one of the things that happens is that Costa Rica was at the forefront of ecotourism, like they're the ones that really spearheaded the initiative. So Costa Rica gets a lot of um, a lot of mention, and and I don't want to downplay the importance that Costa Rica and their National Park Service has um, for this initiative. But one thing that I think we we can do and i i said this sort of through voting with your dollars is when you're traveling especially as birders and for ecotourism is to understand like where you're going and who it belongs to so i've seen a lot of times in big birding tour groups there's this automatic assumption that oh it's a national park you know it's all taken care of whereas there are a lot of a lot of places throughout latin america that are protected by nonprofits. So one thing that ABC did was they created this website con called Conservation Birding. And it's sort of like a portal where you can go and see in different countries, um, areas that are protecting some of the rarest and most unique um, birding sites and habitats in the world, some of the most threatened places. Um, 
so as far as on, on like a, on a larger scale on the United States, it's really tough because there's a lot of competition for ecotourism. And I wish I, could, I had like a magic wand or a magic answer for that. But you guys, as I said, can help the conservation movement and tell people about it. Um, Ecuador isn't as cheap as Peru, but, and even though Ecuador, the currency that's managed in Ecuador is US dollars is still really cheap. Um, it's, it's relatively inexpensive. It's a relatively safe country to travel. It's not as known as say Costa Rica, or I know Colombia is dumping millions of dollars into their ecotourism promotion campaign. So you guys can start by taking an interest in the area and being stewards for us as well. Okay. So we have um, one more question here. Um, I had heard that the Galapagos Islands hadn't been taken good care of as a wildlife habitat. Has this been improved? <laughs> I have mixed feelings about the Galapagos. Um, I think that the Galapagos are incredible from a historical perspective. I mean, it, it's, it's like a destination. You know, it's, it's part of what shaped island biogeography. It's what create it, it, several scientists, Darwin included, um, developed important theories behind speciation because of the Galapagos, but just like any place when it becomes incredibly popular and everybody wants to go there, there is an impact on the landscape. And honestly, as birders guys, and even Bob Ridgely says this, he's like, why would you go to the Galapagos? There are no birds there. Um, and it's really expensive in the Galapagos. So um, I would say that there's still a lot that could be done for the Galapagos. I have been to the Galapagos once before um, to visit the reserve that we were creating. Um, and it is hard when you have a small, very concentrated land mass and a lot of people trying to visit it. So. I would say that the best impact you could have is go to the mainland and see incredible habitats, places that look nothing like what we have in the United States, places that will blow your mind. So um, as far as carrying capacity, there are certain things that are put into place in the Galapagos, like charging a lot more money. You have to pay uh, an entrance fee of $150 just to cover like the National Park Service fee they're supposed to be a lot more strict about making sure that invasive species don't come onto the islands. But the Galapagos are, are as much of a destination as like Cancun. So don't go to the Galapagos, <laughs> go to the mainland. But that's just my pitch. And I'm very subjective about that. All right, well, it looks like um, that's all that we have in terms of questions. So I guess we'll go ahead and uh, wrap this up. So thank you again, Wendy, for the excellent presentation. And thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, for anyone who's on Instagram and wants to follow Wendy or Foundation Hokotoko or Save the Choco, which is a related organization um, to keep up with the latest news and adventures, I went ahead and posted their Instagram handles in the chat box. You want to scroll up just a little bit to find those. Um, if you're not already, please follow Fresno Audubon on uh, social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, our YouTube is also up. Um, you can, if you missed any uh, recent presentations, uh, you can find them there on our YouTube channel. Uh, especially, um, let's see, sorry about that. Uh, we do hope that you'll join us for uh, next month's general meeting, which is scheduled for September 14th. Um, I hope I say this guy's name right. If I don't, I apologize in advance. Our scheduled speaker is uh, Richard uh, Chimino, who is a field guide for Yellow Build Tours. And he will be talking to us about the birds of Belize. And again, forgive me if I mispronounce this, Antical National Park in Guatemala. So stay tuned for an, an, an announcement on that, along with the uh, links for registration for that event. So and that's about all that I have. Uh, so have a great remainder of your week and stay safe out there, everyone. Good evening, Harmstar. Goodbye. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.